The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Well, you know something, NWOites? Well, you're the biggest star in professional wrestling, dude. With the largest arms in the world. When you're the man, they give you that special treatment, brother. Not just on the red carpet, dude. Not just the Hollywood back lots or the fanciest restaurants. But in the World Wide Web, Jack. And when you're the man with the world in his hands, dude, Surfshark VPN is there for Hollywood. The virtual private network keeps me safe when I'm hanging and banging on the net, dude. They keep all my personal info secure, all my private messages private, dude. So those jabronis in the back, brother, can't figure out what Hollywood is scheming. And when I'm on location filming in Italy, Jack, I can watch all my favorite streaming movies and content, even if they're region locked, brother. Surfshark takes me everywhere, dude, with thousands of global servers. So if you NWOites want the exclusive scoop, dude, if you want to live life on the net like Hollywood, brother, go to the link in the description, download Surfshark, and use the code REGRET, brother. Get 84% off your order with an extra four months for free, Jack. This is where the power lies, brother. When you're Surfshark VPN, you're Surfshark for life. Whew. November 24th, 1993, in a year where business is already on a downturn for the World Wrestling Federation, the company has a hard time finding its next big star, and one day after Vincent Mann was indicted for his alleged involvement in the whole steroid scandal, which is a whole can of worms I'm not going to begin to get into in this video, it's time for their Thanksgiving Eve tradition, Survivor Series, Night of Adjustments, from the Boston Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. This show was nominated by Harrison Tatum Wyatt, Adam Vanderplum, and Parker Solsang over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. 15,509 fans packed the place. The show sold out in about an hour before any matches were announced. 180,000 pay-per-view buys, which is actually way down from the previous year. And their .82 buy rate makes it the first pay-per-view in company history with a buy rate of less than one. Vincent Mann and Bobby the Brain Heenan are on commentary here. It's actually Heenan's final pay-per-view on the desk before he eventually leaves and goes to WCW. The show begins with a wholesome Happy Thanksgiving message from Lex Luger and his family, which according to Bruce Pritchard took nearly five hours to film. Now look, my last day job before I did YouTube full time was I was part of a TV production crew and we would go around filming local TV commercials for like businesses here in Reno. You know, I dealt with the occasional client or actor who had a hard time getting their line out and so at most I think the, the longest I spent working with somebody for one line of delivery before we had a suitable take was like a half hour. I would not be able to stomach five hours of filming this one line or something. Whatever the company is paying this crew in Atlanta, it's not nearly enough. Your opening Survivor Series matchup sees Team Captain Diesel leading IRS, Rick Martel, and Adam Bomb against Team Captain Razor Ramon, the 123 Kid, Marty Jannetty, and what's supposed to be Mr. Perfect. We'll get to that in a minute, though. Razor is the new Intercontinental Champion as of a few weeks before this. Shawn Michaels had been suspended after violating a drug test, so uh, Razor and Martel fought for the vacant championship on Raw after being the final two in a battle royal the week before, and Razor won that. So Mr. Perfect is unable to appear. He's not been seen on TV since October. October. Razor says that Perfect tagged himself out before the match could even begin, and that's the last we hear of Mr. Perfect not just in the World Wrestling Federation, but also just in wrestling in general for a few years. There's a lot of conflicting stories as to why Perfect was gone from the company by this point. Some say it was, you know, creative differences or backstage behavioral issues or drugs or injuries. Uh, you know, there's been, I've never been able to find a clear definitive answer as to why this happened, but those years that Perfect was gone, he was sitting out with a Lloyds of London policy for injury, so that probably has more to do with the story here. Probably just needed some time off. But yeah, that's the last that we see of Perfect here. And so in his place is the macho man Randy Savage. Back on pay-per-view for the first time since the Royal Rumble. He's in the middle of a feud with Crush at the moment. More on that in a second. As the match begins, Ramon overpowers Martel a lot. And look at the size of Adam Bomb. Can I just say, I think this gimmick would have gotten over great if they did it like today at NXT. 
Adam works over Razor for a while, but Ramon's able to pop him up for a suplex and the crowd loves it. We get some tension on the heel side when Harvey Whippleman gets decked by Martel and Adam Bomb takes exception to it. Bomb hucking around the 1-2-3 kid like he's nothing. A kid just bumps his ass off in this match. In comes Diesel for more of the same. Kid tags in Savage and he just wrecks everybody. Flying elbow to Diesel, Savage eliminates the team captain. The heels begin to beat down on Razor, but a big knee lift on IRS helps give Razor a chance to get out. Savage on the attack again, but out comes Crush. Now before I go any further, I just have to give the backstory here. Savage and Crush in real life are best friends, but in kayfabe they were best friends until Crush got really jealous and angry with Savage here. He said, you know, Savage is not calling him enough and checking on him while he was recovering from injury, seemingly accusing him of holding him back and using politics to keep Crush held down in favor of himself. So now Crush has aligned himself with Mr. Fuji and that's why they're fighting here. Randy is so distracted by Crush's presence that it allows for IRS to eliminate him. Randy bolts to the back after Crush, and boy, his elimination really killed the crowd for a couple minutes here. It took him a while to actually build things back up with the audience. Janetti's finally in the ring in his very 90s attire. Back to Razor and IRS in the ring. Razor's edge on Shyster and Irwin's gone. Everyone's fighting in the ring. The referee's distracted. IRS is back in the ring. Dex Razor in the tum tum with a briefcase, and Ramon is counted out. We get a glimpse of a clinic with Kid and Martell until Adam Bomb's tagged back. In. Kid almost runs into the referee as he dives to the outside, but Adam catches him and bad things happen. Kid takes a lot of heat here, but is resilient. He tags in Janetti, who's a house of fire. Kid comes back in and rolls up Martel to take him out. And then right after that, quick tag to Janetti, who hits a sunset flip on Adam Bomb, and he wins right afterward. He and Kid are the survivors for their team. This one gets three and a half stars out of five for me. It's actually my favorite Survivor Series match on this show. I think the pacing in the second half was great once it's down to Jannetty and one, two, three, kid. But I like how Randy Savage and Razor Ramon's storylines were, you know, dealt with and addressed in the first half as well. I thought it was kind of weird for Diesel to be eliminated the way he was so early. But besides that, I think, yeah, I've told a pretty good story overall. Uh, one, two, three, kid is, uh, is a big star in this match. He takes a beating here, but to see him be that resilient and end up picking up the win, is pretty cool. Well, Shawn Michaels was serving a suspension for pissing hot in a drug test, but circumstances have forced the Federation to unsuspend him as he's pinch hitting for Jerry Lawler tonight. Michaels still walking around with his IC title belt because he never lost it. It's an angle we'd see revisited once or twice over the years. We tossed to Ray Combs from Family Feud interviewing the Hart family backstage. Brett's had enough of Shawn Michaels and the Knights, all the crap they've been talking about Stu and Helen Hart. Shawn's not worried about his opposition, though. He runs down all the members of the Hearts and says his team will come out on top. We then go to ringside where Ray Combs is the special ring announcer for the Family Feud match. He introduces the Hart family members at ringside, starts grilling Shawn Michaels and begins to talk about how dumb he was on Family Feud. He talks a lot here, just keeps on going. Seriously, Ray, who cares? Because it's time for one of the biggest matches on the card, the Family Feud match, as Bret Hart and his brothers Keith, Bruce, and Owen take on Shawn Michaels and his knights. Okay, if this doesn't make any sense, it's because it doesn't make any sense. This feud was Bret Hart and Jerry Lawler all the way. Hart and Lawler have been feuding for months by this point after King of the Ring. Jerry talking trash about Bret and his parents. And then what happens a week before the show, Jerry only gets indicted for allegedly raping a 15-year-old girl. So he is pulled off the show and he's pulled off commentary and all that stuff. The charges would later be dropped by the way, but Lawler's still out and Sean is in. And even though Sean and Bret did wrestle at the previous year's Survivor Series, he had zero to do with this angle at all. Not been talking trash about the Hart family until... They had to shoehorn this segment in with Sean and Rio Rogers, aka Bruce Pritchard doing a Dusty Rhodes impersonation. And that segment was done to try and like kind of force the fact, that, oh, Sean's talking trash about the Hart family, even though it was Lawler who was clearly doing that the entire time. It's a big mess getting to this point. Let's look at these knights. Greg Valentine as the Blue Knight, Jeff Gaylord as the Black Knight, Barry Horowitz as the Red Knight, and Jason David Frank as the Green Knight. Apparently there was supposed to be kind of a reveal element to this matchup where the knights would be unmasked. Uh, Terry Funk was supposed to be the Red Knight originally, but the day of the show, he backed out and he wrote a letter to Vince saying his horse is sick, it's dying, he had to go. And then also, apparently Jimmy Snuka was considered as one of the Knights. Uh, young Glenn Jacobs was considered as one of the Knights as well, but those all fell through. So that's why we have these guys under the masks here. Keith and Bruce Hart coming out of retirement to join Owen and Team Captain Brett, who's showing up at GAMS tonight, and Patriarch Stu is the corner man. Early miscommunication between Sean and his knights as the Hearts take advantage. Bobby Heenan on commentary is relentless against the Hart family and is so damn funny. And the other brother's name was Bruce, right? 
That's now, isn't right. that a stupid name? Excuse me one minute. Yes. Hey, Stu, wake up! Stu just yelled over to Helen. Helen, I'm damp. Oh, there's a picture of Helen on the back of his jacket. Isn't that nice? I mean, it gets so bad, Vince even calls him out on air and calls him a bad man and says he owes the hearts and everyone else an apology. It's hilarious. Sean and company begin to take over on Bruce. Bruce tries to come back on Sean, but he runs himself into the opposing corner. What a smart guy. I did like his tag out to Brett, though, as he's falling backward. And one of the stories with Bruce, apparently, in this match was he really tried to insert himself and come up with as many spots benefiting him as humanly possible to the point where Sean and even Bruce's brother Brett had to stop him and say, enough, you're not the focus here in this matchup. We get a four-man collision spot and Ray Combs, who by the way has joined commentary for this match, is losing it here. Here we go! Yeah! <laughs> Talk about a club sandwich! A missile dropkick by Owen sends the Black Knight packing. Combs thinks the match is over. It is not. Keith works on the legs of the Red Knight. They can't stop referring to Keith as the fireman and Bruce as the school teacher. Combs describes the chop by the Blue Knight as a weenie slap. What? Heels working over Keith's arm now. Sean and Blue go for the new foundation finisher, but Sean misses. Brett gets the Red Knight in the sharpshooter, and Red is out. Blue and Brett get a lot of time in the ring here. Brett tags in Owen, who's a house of fire. Sean slides out of the ring and gets face to face with Stu, who decks. HBK with a great sell here. Owen dives onto him as well. Bruce is in the ring for ages as we get more miscommunication with the heels. Owen locks a sharpshooter in. Blue submits and Sean's by himself 4-1. to one. He takes a beating but he's able to get the advantage on Bruce. Sean and Brett fight for a while. Sean rakes the eyes mid-backbreaker. Gets rolled up by Sean and is the first member of the team eliminated. Owen's throwing a fit over this and calls Brett selfish for getting in his way as he walks off. Sean tries with all his might to stay in this thing but he finally has had enough and runs away and gets counted out of the match. The Hearts win with three men left on the team. Owen's back to celebrate, presumably, but he immediately gets in Brett's face, takes issue for what happened earlier. He's yelling that he never gets any recognition as Helen Hart looks upset. Todd Pettengill wants a word with Owen afterward, but Owen doesn't want to talk about it. I give it two stars out of five here. I think that the wrestling itself was fine and well done, if a little boring. I also like what they did with Owen at the end of that and how they were telling that story, but the match dragged on a little bit long for me. I think the jobber nights were a bit too competitive, honestly, and the finish, like the count out loss for Sean was pretty disappointing as well. I will say, I wonder if the match would not have been as good if Jerry Lawler was still in the thing because Lawler and Michaels were two very different styles. And even though it doesn't make sense from a storyline standpoint of Sean being involved in this thing, I do think the in-ring quality did go up. I think Lawler might have been as fine of a worker and kind of working the crowd and stuff, but in terms of the actual action in the ring, I think Sean's involvement made that an improvement in my opinion. And of course, they're planting the seeds here for Owen's big betrayal in January, setting up for that all-time great feud between he and Brett throughout 1994. So this is a good way to start that off. Vince and the Brain swap places with Jim Ross and Gorilla Monsoon from Radio WWF for this next match, probably because JR is the best of the bunch to explain the Smoky Mountain universe to keep the TV audience up to speed. Then we get a recap of the main event of the evening, beginning with the recent actions by Ludwig Borga, who recently debuted as this big foreign monster heel. He hands to Tonka his first loss in nearly two years in the Federation on the Halloween episode of Superstars. He and the rest of the foreign fanatics take him out of action. Two weeks later, Lex Luger and the Steiners introduce Tatanka's replacement, The Undertaker. Okay, but why that version of the flag, though? Meanwhile, Quebecer PCO of the fanatics is KO'd and is out of action after he's hit with Lex Luger's loaded forearm, so Crush is brought in to replace him. Now, Crush is not foreign, he's Hawaiian, there's a big difference, but as I mentioned earlier, he is managed by Mr. Fuji, who is also managing the foreign fanatics team, Captain Yokozuna, so the link is there. Jim Cornette makes his way to the ring to introduce the heavenly bodies to the ring. Dr. Tom Pritchard and Gigolo Jimmy Del Rey. Hey, that mustache looks familiar. And now as part of Cornette's seemingly endless mission to get Southern wrestling over with Northern audiences, you've got the Smoky Mountain Wrestling tag titles on the line as the Rock and Roll Express defend against the heavenly bodies. R&R's intro is completely redubbed here. New music, new Finkel voice, new crowd sound, everything. Anyway, this match is part of the ongoing relationship between the Federation and Jim Cornette. Cornette and his own company, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Cornette's also part of Creative at this time, I believe, for the Federation. This is a long-standing feud between the bodies and Rock and Roll Express here. They even wrestled each other in WCW that same year as part of a very similar agreement at the time. That feels like a pretty big piece of history there. 
The bodies jump rock and roll at first, but the Express get the upper hand. Ricky Morton dives into Dr. Tom and Del Rey. The action's fast from the get-go here. We almost get a bad collision during a leapfrog spot, but they cover for it nicely. Ricky and Robert row the boat in the heavenly bodies. More wishbone action. Cool moment where Gibson blocks Morton from hitting the turnbuckle. Dr. Tom wants to try the same thing, but it backfires. That's a really cool spot. Pritchard with a sit-out powerbomb on Ricky, and the heat officially begins. Cornette holds Ricky as Del Rey hits a damned acai moonsault in 1993. What an innovator. A couple of big double teams, including the trash compactor, but Ricky stays in it. JR keeps referring to Morton as a young man. He's 37 here. Morton finally tags in Robert Gibson. The fans are dead silent. Dr. Tom grabs Ricky and throws him over the top. Robert thinks it's a disqualification, but not in the World Wrestling Federation. Thank God. Lots of legal man syndrome for a minute here, but the Express hit their patented double drop kick. But Cornette tosses his tennis racket to Del Rey, who jabs Gibson in the back with a handle. Pritchard covers Gibson to win, and we have new Smoky Mountain Tag Team Champs. I give it three stars out of five. It's a fine match. In fact, it's a great slice of that Southern style tag team wrestling that Jim Cornette is so fond of. And I think that all the guys in this match like hit their points, but the big problem is unfortunately, a lot of the things they do in this match that are very distinctive of that style does not register with the fans here in Boston. They don't know what to make of half of what they see here. They don't know who these people are. So it's like, you know, the crowd's kind of dead for a lot of it. You see a lot of them leaving to go to the bathroom at concessions as the match is going on, which is really unfortunate because again, I think this was a fine match. I mean, SMW did get some great exposure out of this angle and there's some talent exchanges like I mentioned, but the SMW thing just does not really click with the Federation fans at all. Backstage with Bam Bam Bigelow, Luna, the Head Shrinkers, and Bastion Booger, the Head Shrinkers and Booger are just going ham on that turkey. Bigelow says even if there were a hundred doinks, his team will win the day. Bam Bam will take care of doinks, quote, pesty, pesterance and botherance. Jesus, did Bam Bam always just make up words? So we go to that Survivor Series match now as Bigelow, Samu, Fatu, and Bastion Booger take on four Doinks. Doink has recently turned face and has been tormenting Bam Bam and Luna with things like tripwire and buckets of glitter and water. Just really, really devastating stuff here. So there's actually some great like TV work here in the build for this because we've got a couple of segments where Doink will taunt Bam Bam on the big screen and will toss to other recordings of Doink doink and they time it out so well and it all matches up and it's so impressive. There's even a point where uh, one of the doinks on the top pours the bucket of glitter and then you see it pour down from above in the other shot. That is really impressive work and I don't know how they pulled that off. But then soon before the show, the original doink, Matt Bourne, gets fired for too many infractions for drugs. So how do they solve that problem? Well, we're about to find out. Good Lord, are all those guys gonna work a match covered in turkey carcass? That's gross. So who are the doinks? It's Luke and Butch, the doink whackers. Vincent Mann with the biggest lie of the night as he says, we anxiously await two more doinks. It's doinks on a mission. Oscar, Mabel, and Mo are all in clown makeup as Oscar busts a rhyme to the delight of the crowd. So no actual doink in this match, but we do just get four, actually five guys in doink makeup, which, eh. Alpha's on the outside, still eating that turkey. Luke doink bites Booger on the butt and Bastion's able to tag out, but do you see how his eyes light up when Fatu offers some food in the apron? He's so happy then. Samu starts biting up balloons, but one of them's a water balloon. Samu is eliminated by way of water balloon to the face. In comes Fatu, the future Rikishi. Booger gets back in the ring, hits the giant tea bag, or in Heenan's words, a trip to the bat cave. But big bastard Bastion Booger becomes bewilderingly bemused used by bananas. He takes the same bump as before, only now it hurts. Then he gets leg dropped by Mabel and he's out. Damn, what a vulgar display this sequence was. A scooter has now entered the equation. He got a sort of bicycle. What a convoluted way to set up hitting your own partner in the head with your tire. It's really subtle and I feel it could have easily been screwed up in a bad way. Fatu seems to have Mo beat but then becomes distracted by a banana peel. Damn, what is in these bananas? These guys keep becoming mesmerized by them at the worst possible time. We get a very blatant banana peel slip spot by Fatu too here. He had to visibly adjust to get in position for, which of all the stupid spots in this match really irked me because like he wasn't in the right spot for it. Had to visibly, I'm going to really fuck myself over now. Also like what was his plan with the banana peel and how could he be surprised that it backfired? Anyway, Bam Bam's down four to one going against Mabel here. Luna gets dumped with a bucket of glitter, but we don't see it. Bam Bam's distracted by her yelling. He gets squashed twice, a big pile on, and the doinks win. Then up on the screen, it's definitely not the same doink we saw on the screen before. So long, Matt Bourne. Hello, Ray Apollo and your nails on a chalkboard voice. He makes fun of Bam Bam and Luna and cracks a lot of jokes. Waka waka. Oh my God, this part felt so awkward to me because we just saw the recap of Matt Bourne doink on the screen. And it's so 
blatantly obvious it's not the same guy. I wouldn't have even explained it. I would not have even had Doink at the end there. I would have just had the match as it was and that point and then like wait a few more weeks, then bring in Ray Apollo as Doink and hope no one could spot the difference. And the real heartbreaker of it is there's a massive We Want Doink chant at the start of the match here, which had to just eat Matt Bourne alive to not even be there for the most over he would ever be as a babyface. As for the match itself, I give it zero stars. I think for a comedy match, it went a bit too long. I think that the reveal of who the four doinks were was a lot more over and a lot better received than the match itself. And there were a couple of good points here and there, but I think for me, most of the comedy that I got from this was derived from Bobby Heenan's commentary during the matchup. And of course, as a general rule, the longer any match the Bushwhackers goes, the more awkward it gets. And I think the biggest sin of all, advertising four doinks and not one of them is the real doink, boo. Backstage, we hear from the foreign fanatics. It's four wrestlers, three managers, holy hell, what is this, Ministry of Darkness over here? Jim Cornette with a damn fine promo. He says the strategy is to attack the heart, the mind, and the soul of the team, that being the Steiners, the Undertaker, and Lex Luger, respectively. And it's finally time for that main event Survivor Series matchup. You've got the All-Americans, Lex Luger, The Undertaker, and the Steiners versus the Foreign Fanatics, Yokozuna, Ludwig Borga, one half of the Tag Team Champions, Quebecer Jacques, and then there's Crush. This is a continuation of the Lex and Yoko feud that saw their big title match at SummerSlam, ending in a bullshit countout. What a sell by Bobby Heenan during the intros. Yokozuna's not looking at Luger, he's looking at America. A bit of huddling to start things off, a bit of shtick. Yokozuna gets knocked back early by Rick Steiner. Borga in the ring now, he throws Steiner out and right into the cameraman. The first elimination kind of looks like a botch here. Steiner dives onto Borga who catches him, just falls backward and covers Steiner. Rick appears to kick out but the three count stands. Rick is gone and seems to have suffered an injury in the process. Scott lifts up Jacques overhead, goes to throw him but Crush runs it and catches him. I love how Jacques just taunts Scott like a little kid after he gets put down. Crush working on Scott when Randy Savage returns. He's being held back by about a dozen officials and is led away, but then he comes back minutes later. Crush is thrown off by this. Scott drop kicks him out of the ring and Crush decides to go for Savage instead. They brawl and Crush is counted out. Scott Steiner with a huge military press on Jacques. Tag to Lex and he gets a big pop. The body slam, the diving elbow, Jacques is gone. He with a great line saying he single-handedly took out the Beckers. It took him a couple weeks to do it, but he did it. Later, Heenan describes Borga as the wrestler of the 90s, God forbid. Steiner catches Borga up top, hits a superplex, but the pin's broken up. Yoko may or may not be the legal man as he eliminates Scott. Yoko and Luger face off. Nobody cares. They battle for a bit. Zuna goes for the splash, but Lex moves. A couple minutes later, Yokozuna on top again, goes for an avalanche in the corner, but Lex moves again. The crowd goes banana as Undertaker's finally tagged into the match. He withstands all all of Yokozuna's attacks until he's finally slowed down. Yokozuna drags him into the corner, hits the bonsai drop, goes for another one, but Taker sits up just in time. That looked close. Fighting on the outside, and both men are counted out. We are down to one apiece, Luger and Borga, the new monster in town. Borga on the attack, but he's got some lazy cover attempts. Luger finally powers up with a suplex. We get a double down. Cornette and Johnny Polo are up on the apron as Luger covers Ludwig. Mr. Fuji hands Borga a wash bucket, and he clunks Luger with it. Goes Goes for a cover, but Lex kicks out. Luger's fired up here. He decks Borga with the bionic forearm, and he wins. Lex Luger stands tall again, but he still can't beat Yokozuna, and not only that, he has to share the stage with Santa Claus as we fade to black. The guy can't catch a break. This one gets two and a half stars out of five for me. It's an okay match, not a tremendous main event. I thought there were a bit too many count out eliminations for my liking here. The Undertaker's comeback at the end when he gets tagged in is tremendous. And it makes me think again, kind of like Lawler Michaels, in this case, Tatanka Undertaker. Like, would the match have been better if the match was originally as advertised? I think that uh, Undertaker being here, it helps put him over as the next big guy to challenge Yokozuna. I think that the way the crowd reacted to him was a lot hotter than I I think it would have been had Tatanka stayed in the match. Also at this point, Luger clearly not the guy to lead the Federation's new generation. They had a chance at SummerSlam, but they killed any hope of it then. Borga, meanwhile, would never wrestle on pay-per-view again. He got hurt before the 94 Royal Rumble, then eventually left, which is kind of wild considering how strong they pushed him early on. 
My grade for Survivor Series 1993 is a D plus. This show felt like a real drag to watch most of the time. I think all the matches go way too long. There's like no stakes involved in any of those Survivor Series matches, which hey, wouldn't you know it, in 2020 we're still dealing with that problem of a lack of stakes in Survivor Series as a pay-per-view. But I think most damning of all was all those substitutions in almost every Survivor Series match, leading to a lot of these, these, uh, these storylines being halted or just you know adjusted in some other way. Like some of the substitutions felt like they were by design, like watching the build of this. Like Tatanka and Quebecer Pierre, they don't make a whole lot of sense as to why they were replaced, but like they felt like they were storylines and not some kind of punishment or suspension or injury or whatever. I could never find an explanation for those two substitutions. But the other ones involved, those were definitely like out of their hands where they had to do something to cover for it. And it really helped, it really negatively impacts the, those matches they're involved in and the rest of the show as a whole, sadly. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Well, the next three episodes of the classic review segment leading into the end of the year are pretty much all booked up, folks. I'm covering a special trilogy of shows. I'm looking at the last three pay-per-views of WCW's existence. That's Sin, Super Brawl Revenge, and Greed, all taking place in the first quarter of 2001. I'm going to watch these shows shows in order and to see the slow and steady, maybe not so slow, but a steady decline for WCW as they hurtle toward the end of their existence when WWF buys them out and the rest is history. But join me starting in two weeks when I look at that special trilogy of WCW shows. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.